So welcome. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, you were reminiscing a little bit about your last visit to Philadelphia. It was a different time. Uh, yes, I was here for the Democratic Convention in 2016. And uh, it was uh, such a, I was so optimistic and I enjoyed the convention so much. And it was a pretty melancholy, actually, to be back here uh, now in the situation we're in today. And I want to rewind back because it was before that trip that the recall effort actually began. Um, and so let's, let's take a little memory lane trip back. What? Talk about the case, the, the issue, and then why you decided, you know what, I'm going to recall this judge. Uh, so uh, most of you are probably familiar with um, at least a little bit uh, the case of Brock Turner. So for those of you who don't know, I'm a professor at Stanford Law School. Um, I have been teaching at Stanford for 18 years. Um, and Mr. Turner, uh, Brock Turner, was a recruited athlete at Stanford. He was a very, very promising swimmer. And he, uh, swimming is a, a very uh, high pro profile and high prestige sport at Stanford. He had a lot of swimmers go to the Olympics and get medals, and he was one who was supposed to do that as well. Um, and uh, from a very well-to-do family in Ohio, uh, and he was uh, supposed to be NCAA champion, he was supposed to go to the Olympics, and um, in January of 2015, he sexually assaulted a young woman behind a dumpster at a fraternity party. She was completely unconscious. He was caught in the act of, uh, of this crime by two um, unrelated unrelated uh, individuals who were riding by bicycles and saw what was happening and said, hey, what are you doing? Stop. They actually, he got up and ran, they chased him, they tackled him. So he was caught at the scene, he had her DNA on his hands, um, and uh, she was, this was actually a, a much more um, uh, violent crime than is commonly understood. Um, she was completely unconscious. He disrobed her. Uh, he moved her underwear over her boots and, and threw it that way. Her cell phone was you know, pushed that way as well. And he took off her dress to expose her breasts. He photographed her naked body and texted the photos to a groupie chat with his swim team uh, teammates. Uh, who just someone evidently destroyed that evidence because the texts remain saying, whose tits are those? What the uh, pictures were not there when the police went to get them. Um, he, uh, she was, she had laceration scrapes, in, internal injuries um, in her vagina. He, she was scraped and bloody on other parts of her body. So it was a quite brutal um, attack. Uh, he was arrested at the scene, and uh, he asked for a jury trial. Now, that's his right. Ordinarily, if there's that much evidence against you, that would terminate a guilty plea, but it is absolutely his right to take his uh, case to a jury, which he did not. Having done that, however, and losing that roll of the dice, he has been convicted, and he is subject to the laws of the state of California at that point, which prescribed um, for the, he was convicted by the jury on all counts, so two counts of sexual penetration with a foreign object, one count of attempted rape, assault with intent to commit rape. Meaning he had the intent to continue to rape her, um, but he just got interrupted by the bystanders before he could achieve that. And um, the minimum penalty for that uh, attempted rape count is supposed to be two years in prison, um, and it is presumptively not eligible for probation. And in order to give probation, the judge has to make a factual finding on the record that this is an unusual case that is unusually less severe and less deserving of punishment than other similar crimes, and that the interests of justice require probation. And that, we believe, was just an abuse of discretion. Yeah. That he had the discretion, but he... He also had a mitigating factor, which is that he was young, which is why the district attorney asked for the medium range, which would have been four years. But the judge decided not to give the medium range, not to give the minimum sentence, but to go way below it 
and do six months, which in California, under the operation of our law, uh, meant three months. And the victim wrote a very powerful victim impact statement. How many of you read Emily Nozick's impact statement? We read it out at City Hall. Yeah. So for those of you who have not read it, I highly recommend it. It was published on BuzzFeed, and it got more page views than anything ever published on BuzzFeed, which is, sorry, just <laughs> And um, it was very powerful. And so the judge heard her read that whole thing in court and still, and still gave that sentence. And he never really acknowledged her injury. The entire uh, conversation was really about Mr. Turner. And so I'm, I'm going to assume that like the rest of us, hearing about this six-month sentence, I mean, we all saw his face, Mark Turner's face, plastered everywhere. We read that statement and heard about the atrocity that happened to the young woman. Um, you were outraged, arguably, probably a lot more than that. And what made you say, you know what, Judge Kersky, we are not, no. So I'll tell you what it was. Uh, first of all, obviously, it's completely unacceptable. Of course. But um, at Stanford, we have epidemic levels of sexual violence. 43% of our female undergraduate students experience sexual violence during their four years with us. That's actually not an unusually high number for uh, our peer schools. Uh, probably the same at Penn, to be honest with you. What is unusual about Stanford is that only 2.7% of that violence is ever reported to anyone at the university. We have very low rates of reporting. That has to do, I believe, with the fact that Stanford is very unlikely to ever hold anyone accountable. We have very, very poor accountability. Stanford's only ever expelled one student in its whole history for sexual assault, and that student was not Brock Turner, who was not expelled. He was allowed to withdraw voluntarily, most likely because his family wanted to preserve his NCAA eligibility in the event that he was acquitted. So, uh, women students and other individuals who are victimized, because it isn't just women, um, tend not to utilize our disciplinary process or report because they don't think anything will be done about it. And so when uh, we had basically the perfect case, quote unquote, right, most of these cases uh, occur very differently. There are no witnesses. The young person who's been victimized often doesn't remember what happened fully. They may have patchy memories. Um, the young man is not, often it's a man, not caught in the act like this. And so in a case where you have so much evidence to not have accountability, you know, we already have reporting that is in the basement. That is going to rocket it into the sub-basement. It's just completely unacceptable because the message it sent to young women and others who are victimized is don't bother to report because even if you have everything going for you, nothing will be done about it. You will go through all of these indignities and at the end of the day, you will not receive justice. And to individuals who perpetrate these crimes, uh, it says don't worry, if you're rich, if you're white, if you swim fast, if your parents have money, then the system will have your back. And, you know, quite frankly, there are a lot of poor and black and brown people in the penitentiary in California who never attempted to rape anybody. Yeah. And for a lot longer than six months. And so this was a problem of white privilege. It was a problem of uh, affluence privilege. It was a problem of athletic privilege. It was a problem of male privilege. It really checked all the boxes. And it was absolutely outrageous and unacceptable. And we cannot have elected officials who do not take this crime seriously. Women are 51% of the voting public, and we no longer have to accept a situation in which the harms, the sexual harassment, the sexual violence, the domestic violence, domestic abuse that happens to a lot of people, but primarily women, is just ignored, pushed aside, excused, and forgiven. We do not have to accept that. We're not going to accept that. And that is why um, I decided that we needed to get some democracy around this question. Yeah, and like... In a normal world, they would have just withdrawn him and replaced him with someone who was equally bad and would have voted terribly on the court in all the wrong ways, but was not accused of sexual assault and
did not lie about their drinking or whatever else. You know, there are plenty of people who would vote against abortion rights. There are plenty of people who would vote against voting rights. There are, you know, the, the federal society has a stack of these people. They would have just been pull the next card off the deck, and move on. Donald Trump wasn't going to do that. And I think that's the sort of different animal that we are facing. But in a way, it makes, you know, it makes it more clear that we have to get out and fight. You know, if we want to protect women's bodily autonomy and men's bodily autonomy and the rights of transgender individuals and the rights of sexually abused children and we want to stop domestic violence, we are going to have to get out and fight. And so I think that, um, that the place that we can fight best is at the ballot box. And that, you know, the, the equality of the ballot box is our weapon. And we, people fought and died for the right to vote. It is terrible that so many people don't vote. And this is an issue that will motivate some people to vote who wouldn't otherwise vote. So let me just say this about our campaign, about our recall, a couple of reasons that I am inspired or hopeful. 80% of our donors were women. Any of you who are involved in public, fundra uh, public, in public yeah. fundraising know that's, that's a mirror yeah. flare of the norm. 90% uh, of our donors have never been into any political campaign before. 90% of our volunteers have never volunteered in a political campaign before. This is an issue that has the ability to mobilize voters and mobilize people for political action. So I think that you know we can we can turn their what they think is their strength into their weakness. They think that the attack on women is their strength. I know it's their weakness. So, all right. Yeah. Women are women's issues, like sexual violence, gets categorized in that women's issues bucket that male elected officials aren't even asked about. And, and um, so, like, I think that there is a uh, a tendency in the, in the media. Or when there is an issue like this, there is a topic about sexual violence, there is a local issue, for them to go to the female elected officials and get a statement, and then the men don't have to say anything. Mm -hmm. And like city council, we have six, what, six female council members. They get asked about those issues, but we have 11 men who are just not going to get asked. You know, so how do we flip that script from like from the media standpoint and from a constituent and taxpayer voter standpoint saying, ask them, ask them the question, you know, force them to go on the record. So one of the things that we um, want to do, so we started this super PAC, it's called the Enough is Enough Voter Project. You can learn about it at enoughisenoughvoter.org. Um, we definitely need to raise money and we definitely uh, need your support, enoughisenoughvoter.org. And one of the things that we are going to be doing in the off-cycle is developing a scorecard and a set of issues um, to evaluate elected officials on a set of, like, for example, at the state level, that issue package might include uh, voting to repeal the statute of limitations. Um, at the federal level, it could be sponsoring the Violence Against Women Act. But we will have a set of issues, they will be evaluated, they will be judged, they will be called, they will be sent questionnaires, they will be required to answer if they want to be rated um, by our organization. So we intend to hold elected officials accountable, and believe me, that Kavanaugh vote is going to be uh, one of those things, but it isn't going to be the only thing. I mean, there will be ways of holding people accountable. And I, I agree that um, journalists, too, need to uh, need to do the very thing that you're, what I think is so great about what you all are doing is you really are, you're ahead of us. I mean, we're just figuring it out. I saw Nina at this, uh, at the NOW convention, and she talked, and she talked, she was singing our song. I mean, she was talking about holding these people accountable, holding them out, and I was like, uh, I was with my whole team, we had like 30 of us there, and I was like, we gotta go get her. We gotta go find her, I don't know who she is, but maybe she took her up, you know? And I ran over to her and I was like, this is who I am, and I really want to talk to you because what you're doing here in Pennsylvania with your petition and so forth is exactly what needs to happen. We need to hold not only the people who are committing these offenses like David Lynch accountable, but we need to also hold the people who defend them and enable them and stand by them.
and listening to you talk, I, I'm, 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 oh, I'm a very good counselor. <laughs> As I'm listening to you talk, I'm thinking historically you could take out women and plug in African America because there's been a 400 year history of abuse and a variety of ways of, of uh, related to African Americans. But my, my, my question is, um, why, why do you think such a large percentage of white women um, were not, are not supportive of these issues? And uh, seemingly, anyway, I saw a woman on, on, I think she was on the news talking about well, getting vote dislocations with her daughters. And, and I saw another article that said about 90% of all elected officials in America are white males. And so when you say men, it's a, to me that seems a bit misleading that, that white males are not adequately called out because they are the power brokers in this society. So Yeah, that's true. Um, I, I, would, I would say that. Um, but I would also say on the question of women, um, I mean, this is a very important question. And I do think that white women in particular, older white women, it isn't just white women, it's older white women. I mean, there's a generational and a racial and a class component to it. I mean, I think if you really did sort of the right kind of regression analysis, it's older, affluent, white women who live in predominantly white communities. Um, although Tennessee is its own problem. Um, and, yeah. What? What's older? Over 50. Okay. Over 50. And particularly over 60. The and what? For the demographic. Yes, yes. And, um, and I don't, I think that, you know, yeah, I believe it is their connection to powerful white men. That's it. And so I think that um, that is a very hard uh, problem to solve. Uh, and so uh, I don't have a ready answer for you. On the question of, you know, the sort of political theory underlying what we are doing, being similar to the political theory underlying other civil rights movements, that's exactly right. I mean, I didn't actually create this theory, this is really Bob Moses' theory, the idea that we have to vote. You know, if we want political change, we're gonna have to vote for it. We're gonna have to make this issue the thing we vote about, and we're gonna have to get to the polls, and we're gonna have to get to the vote. Um, and I think that the sort of movement strategy that we're using is very similar to the movement strategy, and I don't mean to diminish the importance of these differences at all, but the movement for police accountability for police violence is very similar. You have very powerful people victimizing less powerful people and getting away with it and never being held accountable. Now, I understand that there are a lot of very important differences, and I don't mean to diminish the, the Black Lives Matter movement in any way, um, or uh, by comparing it to something that is um, that is so different. But I do see some parallels there in terms of trying to figure out how to use the electoral process to get accountability where there isn't any. Fun. It's almost like a video game. So I want you to give information about it. 
Um, in terms of what you can do, like I think organizing with your friends to find out when there are uh, protest marches and things like that, but I also think you can do letter writing, you can do postcard writing, you can do phone banking, you can call, like you can target someone like David Leach and you can decide to just show up outside his office holding signs like, you know, you know, you are a horrible sexual harasser design. You know, you could just do that, you know, once a month, you know, you could just have that be your project, you know, or whatever. Like, you, there's no limit. You still have a voice. Uh, but I agree that having a vote is better. And, uh, and you know, our, our idea, I call it radical accountability, but really there's nothing less radical in our society than voting. So many different men, different mentality. It seems hard. It seems hard. It seems it seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything else is a challenge. So.